city on a hill. Luke chapter 17, 1 to 4. Now the title comes from a picture of the church. From Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I I wonder if my job as pastor sometimes is, is an electrician. It's like, how, how high the luminescence is turned up on the lights of our church. I got to attend a, a workers' retreat this week for New Alliance workers. Now, it's a little bit past due. I've been here for two years, but COVID and stuff. And probably the most heartfelt moment of that was the one guy who's kind of in charge of like pastoral discipline. So if I get out of line, he's the guy who's going to have to deal with it. And he came and he said, you know, hey guys, deal with sin in your life before you're the subject of someone's podcast. Before the CBC cameras are coming in. It's a scandal in a church. Well, it hit me because like, I'm sure... I have the capacity, if I let sin go unchecked, to destroy this church. It's there, the sin that dwells in me. And even as that is, and we see the big scandals of the church, and these bring, bring us shame, Jesus says not just pastors are the light of the world, but you are the life, the church. And the fact is, what most people know of Jesus Christ is your witness day by day, in your job, in the grocery store, playing pickup basketball. Got to do better on that next week. <laughs> and be like, and the next time I block somebody, be like, get that. No, I'm just going to not say anything. They know they got stuff. You are the witness. And because of this, Jesus spends almost what we see an inordinate amount of time making sure his people who are called to be the light of the world shine their light. Ultimately, we want to show the world the light of the gospel, the truth of the gospel in every place we go. You guys are our marketing committee. It's your guys' life and it's my life. It's us together as we are out in this world that is the marketing committee and they will hopefully know us by our love and not just by the fact that we sometimes buy Christian stuff. So there are going to be three, three ways in which we can be a church that displays the gospel. And one is by not leading others into sin. So verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 1 of Luke's gospel. And he, Jesus, said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. And in fact, so this is an interesting translation because so temptations up here, temptations to sin, literally that means stumbling blocks are sure to come. And back here, one of these little ones to sin, to stumble, and it's the same word, it's just the verb up there, and it's a noun that that they are stumbling block. And what it refers to is the trigger of a trap, like a snare trap catching like a, a bird or something. For us, this might be a little bit like a mouse trap. Who loves to play with the old-fashioned mouse traps? Oh, I love to play with them. It is so much fun. 
this probably speaks to some deep psychological angst in my heart, but I just love to take the little bar and set it down across there and put that thing so delicately in the trigger. And if you just like flinch a little bit, snap, it's gonna like snap your fingers and gonna hurt a lot. And so the little like snappy part, the part that you put the peanut butter on, you touch the, and the mouse is dead or your finger, not dead, but hurt. That is like the stumbling block. And so Jesus is saying that there are these little triggers there that are sure to come. This world is full of a myriad of ways to sin. We haven't even, we're always coming up with new ways to sin. You know, the path to holiness is very short. The path of unrighteousness just like goes forever in different branches and eventually all of them, the, all of the paths of sin lead to death. But those triggers, those traps come. But then Jesus says, but woe to the one through whom they come. Woe to whom, through whom they come. And we get this picture, this devastating, like Jesus used the most frightening language here. Because I don't know if you've ever been swimming with something heavy attached to you. I think maybe I've gotten like thrown into a pool with like my clothes on. It's kind of hard to swim with your clothes on. Now take a millstone, like a 10 pound weight, tie it around your neck and get cast into the sea. Not coming back from that one. In fact, that's a horrific and awful picture. I don't even need to like, it's like, you don't need to picture it. But Jesus says, that situation is far better than being a trigger for one of these little ones to sin. Now in this, in Luke's gospel, we don't get a, a kind of reference for what little ones is. In Matthew's gospel, like the first reference is probably children, but children are a, are a picture of someone new to the faith, maybe someone weak in the faith. And if we are leading people into sin, this is a terrible and awful thing. And we need to avoid it like we avoid going for swims with, uh, you know, concrete boots like the old mobster movies, you know, give them the concrete shoes in the dock. John Owen said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And it's so devastating what sin does to a church. We need to avoid, how can we be a church that displays the gospel by not leading others to sin? So how do we do this practically? The first is, as Christians, we need to understand good doctrine ourselves. We don't want to end, and the sin leading under stumbling blocks is probably like stumbling that's going to lead people astray. Like we need to be able to express to our children, to someone young in a faith, what is the gospel? What is the difference between salvation by faith alone that we teach and salvation by works, which some other churches, which I won't name, teach? We need to be able to tell our friend to be saved in Jesus Christ means that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's nothing that you need to do except for the consequences of faith, which is repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus Christ. Jesus does everything. Jesus gives everything. But we need to know our Bibles. Secondly, I think the biggest way that, like I personally lead people into sin, and the biggest way that we lead people into sin is by how we model things for our children, for the young people around us, for the young Christians around us. Because we learn more than anything else, we learn by watching what people we respect do. And it's the old, like, the old uh, song, Cats in the Cradle, like, Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon. You know, it's a sad song. It's like, the boy, like the dad never has time for the boy. And then one day the dad is old and all of a sudden the boy is like too busy to come and visit. And guess what? Like 
He learned the lesson. He learned the lesson from his dad. You fill up your life with busyness. That's more important than people. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, the little boy blue and the man in the moon. And that's how it goes. We teach by how we act. And this is, uh, this is a hard thing for me to think about because uh, I'm not going to play out anyone in particular, but if I see my child getting upset, and like snapping and getting really angry, and I think to myself, wow, who taught them how to do that? I taught them how to do that. By every time that I snapped and I got angry. Woe through whom the temptation comes. And so when we are thinking about our lives, the destructive power of sin in our lives does not just harm us but it harms the people that look up to us, most especially the tender and innocent. And so this fight against sin is more important than just, oh, this is, you know, this is making my life difficult, the fact that I get, I'm short-tempered. But this is actually being a witness to the naive and simple and my children. We can be a church that displays the gospel by not leading others into sin. Secondly, How can we be a church that displays the gospel by gently warning others of sin? And this is verse 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Now, who uses the word rebuke on a, you know, everyday basis? I'm looking for this person. I'm thinking, "Ah, this isn't the person that I want to hang around with a whole lot. (laughs) Now, the word rebuke is kind of an an anachoristic word, like it's an old-fashioned word, and it simply means to warn, but it's not like, you know, hey, you better put on a jacket because it's cold outside today. It's like, well, my wife, you're putting on a jacket before you're going outside today. Like it's it's stronger than just sort of like a a gentle thing. It's It's a strong warning. And so this simply says, if your brother, now your brother is speaking of, if another Christian in the church sins, Jesus commands you to warn them sharply about that sin. Now this is a, this is the kind of doctrine that, I mean, Jesus said, just command, like right here, no ifs, ands, or buts. This is something that we should be doing if we are taking Jesus seriously. But it's probably a doctrine that we need some bumpers on. So anybody gone bowling with like little kids and you ask them to put up the bumpers, you put the bumpers up so then the ball can go ting, 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 strike down the middle. Awesome. Look at that. Because there are lots of ways to go into the gutter here, and we know this because we don't like the person that goes around pointing out everybody's sins. Be like, <laughs> because those people drive me crazy, especially when they're pointing out my sin, but most especially is generally they violate some of these principles. And principle number one, if you're warning someone of sin, is the log in the eye principle. Now, Jesus tells us about this. Take out the log out of your own eye before you remove the speck from your brother's eye. And it's just a principle that what other people do seems 40 times bigger than what we do. And so when we see somebody who might have a problem of being a little, uh, maybe abrasive in their language, they can be a little rude. We have to think, this is appearing 40 times worse than in my life. And so I have to be interested to think about myself first before I warn them. Now we have to warn them. Jesus commanded, brother sins, warn them. Secondly is the relationship principle and that this kind of warning about sin needs to be done in relationship. Now if you just want to walk around being like pointing out other people's sins, like that is not what this is getting at. What this is getting at is that we need to be caring and loving of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are so in their lives that we can come alongside and say, you know, 
how you handled that with that person yesterday was like, that was really out of line. Like, like are, are you okay with this? Because this is a conversation. This isn't a, you're bad over there. Because, as we all see, temptations are sure to come. We are all fighting sin in some way. None of us have attained perfection. And so we are a fellow beggar. Like we are a fellow sinner coming alongside as someone who is struggling as well, helping them along. Now, this is something we really want to do in our small group ministries. This is kind of our, our principle. The guys in my, in my men's group know this is our principle, like calling is to hold each other accountable, pray for one another, confess our sins, and to be so in each other's lives that we can call one another out without getting into a fight because I know they love me and they know I love them. So we can talk about hard things. Ideally, this is how our marriages should be too, but we're all working on that as well. This command of Christ is something that's, you know, in polite society, it's easy to ignore, but sin is so destructive that Jesus gives this command because Sin, if we let it go unmolested in the church, if we don't fight against it, it's a little bit like not repairing a roof. You know, you're okay for a little bit, but here and there in the seams, there's going to be a drip, drip, drip of water. And you can ignore that water for a long time. But you ignore it for long enough, and the whole building is going to be ruined uncontested, unmolested sin in the church is the same thing. It is the drip of water that will eventually destroy the whole, the whole thing. And so we need to take it seriously. We need to love each other enough to warn them. But then, the last principle is the Galatians 6.1 principle. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. And so when we are thinking of someone else's sin, we are looking towards restoration. We aren't thinking, oh, they're a sinner now. This is a convenient way to get them to like leave the church because we don't want to deal with it. No, we are looking to bring people in with this. And at the same time, watch yourselves, lest you be tempted because we're all prone to failing in numerous ways, as history tells us. Finally, how can we be a church that displays the gospel? By forgiving others. This leads to it. So, if your brother sins, rebuke him, warn him, and if he repents, forgive him. Forgive him. A forgiveness means freedom from sin. Forgiveness is about the gospel, and ultimately we forgive because God has forgiven us. Not by waving a magic wand, but by the cross of Jesus Christ in which he paid the penalty for our sins so that when we repent and believe in him, we could be in right relationship and full fellowship with him, not for a day, but for forever. This is what forgiveness means. Forgiveness is about relationships. Now, I think we've often been too influenced by something I call therapeutic forgiveness. And that's the idea that, that you forgive primarily so that you can have more peace with yourself, so you can be at peace. But the Bible, forgiveness is not primarily about how we feel about our peace. It's primarily about relationships, restoring relationships. When God forgives us in the gospel, it's not because he needs to be more at peace with himself. He was fine with himself before we ever came along. He forgives us so that we can become in right relationship with a holy God, so that we can be right. The same way forgiveness is about restoring a relationship. Full forgiveness, and this is an interesting text here, because it says, if your brother sins, so if he sins, what your job to do is to warn him, to rebuke him. If he repents, 
forgive him. Now in this sense, we have to be careful here because we don't want to get this wrong. In this sense, full forgiveness is conditional upon repentance. Now you have to hear what I mean by full forgiveness. So the whole verse here, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, why is it conditional? And the first reason here is that this kind of full forgiveness models how we receive forgiveness in Jesus Christ. So Jesus in the cross, God in the cross doesn't just say, okay, everybody in the world, now you're all forgiven. No, you're forgiven on the condition that you repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a condition for full forgiveness. Now, a lot of people use, and it's okay to use forgiveness like this because the word forgiveness doesn't have a technical meaning. It sort of means to, to let go. And we often use forgiveness to talk about the heart of forgiveness. And, and this is true because we need to have a heart all the time that's willing to forgive. Just like God in the gospel has opened the door for anyone to walk through and find salvation, we as Christians need to have the same heart. If someone sins against us, we have that door open, ready for them to walk through in repentance so we can have a restored relationship and then continue on as if that sin is gone as far as the east is from the west. The heart of forgiveness is this door that we leave open. And Jesus even says, you know, if they sin against us seven times in a day, and this is you know, maybe a little hyperbolic, but I could imagine somebody gossiping about me and be like, hey, um, you really shouldn't do that. And then they're like, oh, I'm really sorry. It's like, I forgive you. And then five minutes later, and they're like, and then like the sixth time, I'm like, everything. <laughs> But no, that's how far, because this models God's forgiveness, which isn't just once, He forgives us of sin many, 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 many times. And we need to treat others the same way. Now, forgiveness in this like full forgiveness sense always looks different if someone never repents. Now, if they don't repent, it means that relationship is not going to be restored in a way. Now, it means for us, like, we gotta, like, all those books on forgiveness that talk about ther therapeutic forgiveness, like, they get this right. Like, you have to have a heart that lets go of bitterness. You have to have a heart that leaves that door open. But in the full sense of forgiveness, you haven't, like, forgiven them until that relationship is restored. And so you can't just be like, I've forgiven you and I'm standing right there. No, you have to have, I have the door open for this relationship to be restored. We need to talk about this and figure it out see what's going on here, get the truth in the open so this relationship can be made new. Full forgiveness is conditional upon repentance. Now, I could imagine that there are situations that are so hard when we talk about forgiveness. I think about, you know, we talked about marriage a couple weeks ago. I think about a wife whose husband has committed adultery, not just once, but a number of times and he comes back and he's like I am really sorry every time and then does she like open the door and say okay now we're all good again and by saying like it's conditional upon repentance what this means is true repentance and so so what this might look like if they're in my office I'm gonna say husband like you need to go for counseling for sexual addiction for six months and then we're going to talk because real repentance says, I'm going to take the consequences for this and sort of false like, hey, I, I, I repent. Like, if you're not willing to actually take consequences, it's not really repentance. Full forgiveness leads into right relationship. Now, the church displays the gospel by forgiving others and ultimately Forgiveness leads us out of sin. And this is the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of what the church is called to be. 
is that when not only we know that God has the heart of forgiveness leaving the door open for us to come, to, when we know our brothers and sisters in our small group, our close companion, so that when we go and we say, I am sorry I did this, that they can look in our eyes and say, I forgive you. I welcome you into full fellowship. You are loved and appreciated. And we good now. We are walking into the future putting sin behind us because forgiveness is not just something that gives us an excuse to sin that's not what forgiveness is supposed to do forgiveness frees us from sin by allowing us day by day to bring it into the light to go this is like my men's group to go be like hey guys i did a terrible thing this week and they're like hey how are you not going to do this terrible thing this week okay well we're going to do this we're going to keep you accountable on this and like you know what? We look, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. I mean, we forgive each other and we cry and we work on it. And this is what the church is called to be. Not a church. And this is, we think of the city on the hill. And we think we have to be a church of like Ned Flanders. And we're out there like, howdy doody neighbor. And we're like looking all, looking all good and perfect on the outside. But what truly displays the gospel of Jesus Christ is that when we can show our weakness and we can show what forgiveness is like so that they see us not just as this perfection of people, but as people who bring sin into the light, who do fight it, fight against it. Like we might look worse because we're like leaving it in the open, but we're not afraid because we're forgiven. And so we can daily look and take an inventory. We can talk to our brothers. We know we have forgiveness. Because ultimately we know sin dies in the light. Like you bring it into the light and it has no power over you. We can deal honestly with sin. How can we be a church that displays the gospel by not leading others into sin, modeling good lives? gently warning others of sin and ultimately being the church that is known for their forgiveness. And that's our prayer. That's my prayer today for every one of us that we are known as a church that admits our sin, forgives each other, and still loves and lives to tell another day. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that we would be a forgiving church. I pray that we would not have fear thinking, oh Lord, if they only knew, but that we would say, Lord, they do know, they forgive, and we still love. Let us be that church. In Jesus' name, amen.